When Venus meets Mars in Aquarius, what comes up is that wrestling match between the part of you that wants to control things and understand them and have them make sense, and the part of you that every time you think you're doing that, the rug gets pulled out from under you. This this is the, the Aquarian process. Every time you think you've got the big picture about what's going on and what's what's happening in your life and your nature, um, you get s stunned by this X factor of the unknown, which comes in many different forms. Does it feel like your relationships are particularly strained right now? Or are you feeling more internal conflict than usual? If so, you are definitely not alone. These themes are huge in the cosmos right now and will be over the next few weeks. So today you're going to learn why that is and get some incredible tools for working with it all. So you can come out of this time period better than ever. I want to welcome you to the Astrology Hub podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Poole Walsh, the founder of Astrology Hub. And today we are speaking with a true visionary, wonderful astrologer and author, the creator of soul level astrology, the one and only Mark Borax. With Mark's insight, will illuminate a powerful upcoming transit. Venus and Mars conjunct in Aquarius, happening on February 21st of 2024. But again, its energy will be felt well into March. If you want to dive deeper into how this conjunction may influence your relationships and how you feel about yourself, or if you've been on a path of integration between your inner feminine and masculine, maybe you feel too much of one or the other, a little out of balance, then this is the episode for you. Mark is an upcoming astrologer guide in our Inner Circle Expand membership. And Inner Circle members, Mark's going to share a little bit about the mastery class that he's going to be teaching to you all very shortly here. But I think that you'll all find that his unique perspective on the world and warm, down-to-earth sense of humor, I think you're all going to find it helpful. And I'm confident you'll get the insights that you need to ride these waves gracefully. And we'll be covering one important transit of this year here today. But if you're curious about all of the most important transits of 2024, you'll want to grab your free 2024 blueprint written by some of our top astrologers. It's going to give you foresight on the rest of this year so you can plan and prepare for what's ahead. Go to astrologyhub.com slash 2024 guide to grab your free copy today. All right, let's get started. I hope you enjoy learning more about Venus and Mars and Aquarius, guided by Mark's wisdom. Mark, welcome to Astrology Hub. I'm so happy you're here again. It's great to be back, Amanda. All right, so let's talk about this. Why is it such a big deal? Tell us about this transit globally and why we should be paying attention. Well, Venus Mars is not, uh, it's a fairly frequent transit. It happens about once a year or so. So it's not rare, but it rarely gets used for its maximum capacity and most positive impact. And and what I mean by that, how, what I mean by saying that a transit gets rarely used is um, one of the earliest discoveries um, that the man who taught me uh, the deep astrology, William Lonsdale, he changed his name to Elias Lonsdale. One of his first big discoveries was that when transits occur, when any aspects occur in the sky, um, there's such a wide diversity of responses that people all over the world have to them, depending on where those people are at in many, many ways, almost to the point where he felt um, it was absurd to try and boil it down to cookbook astrology. And, and so he taught us how to look at these things from the soul. So when we go down in, oh, and by the way, soul level astrology, which I created in 1987, that's based on this idea that there's this part of you that knows exactly who you are, what you want, how to get it and what to do when things get in the way. It's your soul. You could also call it a core nature. 
you don't necessarily need any religious context to it, but it's the core self. And this part of you, I feel came back from the dead, came back from incarnation after incarnation into this body, into this life. So there's a part of you that knows where you've been, where you're going, who you are and how to get there. But because you're human, your conscious everyday nature is not always in consistent touch with that deeper inner part of you. Usually only intermittently, only occasionally, some people never at all in touch with that deeper part. So then my role as a soul level astrologer is I don't need to tell you what to do. I need to activate that part of you that already knows. And so I'm using all my poetry, all my training, all my magic to conjure the part of you that knows exactly who you are, even when everything's breaking down, even when your personal life is in chaos, even when the world is in chaos, there's a part of you that isn't. And so when we look at any transits, when we look at life or the birth chart from that view, from the soul level view, for with Venus and Mars, for example, the reason why it doesn't always get utilized it rarely gets utilized to to full capacity and the most positive impact because that conjunction summons the most uh, life affirming qualities of the masculine and the most life affirming qualities of the feminine to find common ground to meet and to each give and take something vital from the other so, so if Venus conjunct Mars, which happens about once a year and is happening now, if Venus and Mars summons the most life renewing, life affirming qualities of the masculine and the feminine to find common ground and each give and take something vital to and from the other, What's happening is that first your relationships are going to be in the hot beam of, of growth weight, growth rays right now. And, and so your relationship might be breaking down. It might be getting better. It might be exacerbating, but there's a spotlight on the, the male female, even in one, even in a single person. And so it's not just the masculine out there in the bodies of men and the feminine out there in the bodies of women. It's the male, female in each of us. So what then do the masculine and feminine have to give and take from each other in this, in this common ground at this time? Well, what the feminine is really charged up to receive from the masculine is his tremendous force and power in the service of inner nature and essential truth rather than obstructing inner nature and essential truth so so in this common ground the feminine in all of us and the feminine out in the world is looking to take something from the masculine and what is it it's the great strength and power of the masculine used in the service of truth and inner nature instead of obstructing it like is happening all around the world in politics, in, in media, the, the, the great power of the masculine is used to block inner truth and contradict true nature. In this meeting of the two, Venus and Mars, the feminine is really wanting to receive that, really Put your strength down into the service of what's really happening, who we all really are, not who we appear to be. The masculine is looking to receive from the feminine her tremendous purity of love, embrace that signals to him the directions he's chosen with his willpower are totally supported by, by the goddess. So, so the masculine in this common ground is seeking to receive from the feminine this tremendous purity of love, this envelopment, this, um, this being enclosed by the grace 
of the goddess with with the certainty that what the masculine is doing with his life is totally being supported. So this is why, even though Venus Mars happens about once a year, it rarely gets used to full capacity and for maximum positive impact. Mm. Okay, let me see if I understand what you're saying. So there, Venus and Mars are coming together in the sky. I love Stormy Grace says that they're they're making love, like they're coming together. They're they're making love, right? Yeah. And each wants something from the other. And this, yep. you, like you said, it's not necessarily male female relationship, although it can be. It also can be the masculine and feminine within each one of us as individuals. Absolutely. What the feminine is looking for is the full bodied support of the truth of who and what we are and to not obstruct that to mm -hmm. to support it and to help it actually grow and come to fruition in our own lives as individuals with each other so that's what the feminine is yearning for in this in this Venus Mars conjunction and the mar the masculine is looking to be enveloped and appreciated and validated in his pursuit of doing that, in his efforts to do that. And he needs that to come through the feminine essence in a very pure and loving and nurturing way. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you nailed it. Okay. Now, how, like, how, if, if people... How might this be coming up in their in in their lives? How might they they be experiencing this? Because you know, in the beginning, I said that you could be experiencing conflict or tension. If you're experiencing conflict and tension, and not this ideal that we just talked about, what will it feel like? What kinds of things are coming up? What kinds of arguments? What kinds of frustrations? What kinds of tension? What will what 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 will come up will be everything in your life and your relationship that's not that. If if you're not being totally supported by by the masculine willpower um, uh, honoring and 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 strengthening your your deepest nature and your truth, what's going to come up is the ways that that's not happening. Is what's in the, what's in the way of that happening? Maybe you inherited some obsolete belief system from your parents or your previous lovers and and maybe and maybe the relationship you're currently in isn't what it should be maybe the relationship you're currently in shouldn't even be M maybe you're not in any real relationship with any lover and so in your life where the wedding of the sun and the moon haven't occurred yet where where the part of you that is a powerful heroic love warrior where, where, where that that part of you that's a spiritual warrior um, hasn't come to the full support of your tender, um, creative, feminine nature. In, in regardless of what body you're in, what body your soul is in, where those things are not working is going to become um, irritated, and 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 so those things will come up. So that the places where the masculine does not feel supported by the feminine, and maybe with good reason, maybe the shit that the masculine is doing doesn't need to be supported. Uh, uh, or maybe the masculine is really innocent and like a boy and just really following their truth. But the feminine in that person's life is not getting it and and is 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 not loving it and surrounding it. So so. That common ground, wherever you, wherever you haven't found common ground with your opposite sex or your lover or yourself or your key relationships, um, the initiation is to probe those areas, to poke those areas, to realize there's there may be there may be a better, fuller way for these forces to to meet within you and around you. You know, Mark, I have recognized that sometimes. I have externalized my own resistance to embracing the full 
qual- the full feminine qualities and made it about somebody else in my life, seeming like they were restricting those things. But really, I was restricting those things. And when I showed up in that full uh, feminine magical capacity, they were absolutely received by the by the masculine. So sometimes we think it's the other person limiting us into certain boxes, but really we're doing it to ourselves. And it can be very surprising and delightful, actually, to show up more of ourselves and for it to be received. And then it's, you know, and we were the ones blocking it the whole time. Yes. Yeah. And this is a deep truth. This is a truth of the soul, the soul level side of relationship. It it connects to karmic theater, which is an idea I explore in my books and, and my classes. What what you're saying is powerful and I'm sure well earned because of whatever you've had to go through to catch yourself at that. So, you know, what you just said is a deep key. It's a deep medicine key that you've created externalized versions of your own resistance in the form of drawing others to you who then act out your disowned shadow, but also offer you a chance to reown it because now you see what it looks like more objectively. It, 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 it's an incredible process, actually. So how does Venus and Mars being conjunct in Aquarius color this whole discussion we're having? It colors it, especially through eight degrees Aquarius. It, it colors it through the Aquarian polarization between uh, the human desire to classify intelligence and the human desire to embrace the mystery. This is the Aquarian side of this. There's this part of Aquarius that wants to name names and classify and scientize and just break it down and make it logical and you can depend on it. And it says here in this in this book, like the idea that there are five senses, for example, which Aristotle said in Greece a long time ago. And ever since Aristotle said that, everyone's been saying, yep, there are five senses. And and then Rudolf Steiner came along more than 100 years ago and he found 12 senses that he associates with the 12 signs of the zodiac and and you know and who who's to say he's wrong maybe there's even more than that and um and so that part of aquarius that feels the need to classify intelligence and and analyze it can be opposed to the other part of aquarius which wants to embrace the radical mystery, surrender to the cosmos. And so when Venus meets Mars in Aquarius and um, and what comes up is that um, that wrestling match between the part of you that wants to control things and understand them and have them make sense. And the part of you that every time you think you're doing that, the rug gets pulled out from under you. This this is the the Aquarian process. Every time you think you've got the big picture about what's going on and what's what's happening in your life and your nature, um, you get stunned by this X factor of the unknown, which comes in many different forms. And so. Um, There's a shadow side to this meeting ground in eight degrees Aquarius. um, And 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 it has to do with the need to control and identify and understand, which is a beautiful need, but sometimes can get limited by not breaking out of its own security system and its boxes. And, And so that Aquarian Aquarian consciousness has a dark side. It's the negative side of group mind. It's it's like it's like negative extraterrestrials or science fiction movies. The it's it's like um Saruman and Isengard in Lord of the Rings. It's 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 the human intelligence grown cold and calculating and militaristic. Um and and so so 
along with the group mind of like the 1960s Aquarian age, like we're all in this together and all you need is love. You can't just have the bright side of the Aquarian age without the dark side. So we're getting initiated. Did, did that answer your question? It does. And I, I'm trying to equate it to the, the earlier discussion of Venus and Mars and the things that might be coming up in our relationship. And as you were speaking, I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if we may experience this as getting way too heady about what's happening in our relationships, you know, getting out of our bodies, not allowing us to actually feel what's coming up. Because in order to become really aware of these dynamics, we need to actually feel what we're feeling. It won't really help to just analyze them in our heads. So it, would you would you say that that could be uh, something that we're more prone to do because these energies are in Aquarius right now? Yes. Yeah. And that's that's always the thing. Again, just what you said, there's there's this tendency when relationship gets wonky to um, to up level instead of inhabiting your chakras and your hara and you know your pelvis and your your sex organs and your whole body it's like i'll send it up to the mind and i'll fin finesse it i'll figure it i'll analyze it and and modern people especially modern spiritual seekers and modern metaphysical practitioners especially tend to be in their heads a lot more than in their body and their presence and their uh, vulnerable child and their sexual erotic um, uh, rawness, the whole thing. I tend to feel when I when I'm in relationship um, difficulties and quandaries um, and I've had a life that's wealthy in relationship difficulties and quandaries, I've I, I kind of won the jackpot. Um, I have to resist the tendency to ego battle this thing out and just continue to breathe and inhabit what I'm really feeling because I'm always feeling something deeper than my defensive nature thinks I'm feeling. You know, there may be shame, there may be guilt, there may be lust, there may be remorse, there may be um, ecstasy. I mean, there's all of that. And and so dropping into what you're really feeling at this time and, and at any time is the only antidote. It's the only medicine. So what you're saying is powerful and applies to to more than just the conjunction period. Hmm. So if people are in that place right now where they're 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 experiencing tension there, it sounds like both the masculine and the feminine are feeling unsupported. I mean, it, it, if the tension's there, they're both feeling unsupported and um, unacknowledged and misunderstood potentially. Yeah. And so if, if, if people are feeling that, experiencing that, I'm going to ask you this question because I know that you've, you've been through your uh, PhD level relationship training. <laughs> <laughs> What do we do? I mean, you just said breathe, feel it. And then what? You know, how do we get to the bottom of it? Is this a relationship that needs that is expired that needs to we need to move on for? Is there something here for us? Because and we can tell there's something here for us because we're hooked and we're emotionally responded and we're not, you know, we're up in our heads, you know, all those things. What what would you advise that or, or what might be a good approach for working through these th different things that are coming up? Well, the first stage, it has to be a, a, a multi-stage um, anecdote, antidote, not anecdote, but maybe <laughs> anecdote too. Uh -huh. Multi-stage anecdotal antidote. And uh, the first stage is recognizing that some deep part of you fully knows what you need to do in that relationship. Mm. That is the first and the most important step of the process and you know and i'm going to tell you the same thing whether you're asking a question about your relationship or any other life question any other deep question i'm always going to say to you the first step and you really have to firm this one 
you re you got to make love to this one. You got to plant it in in bottom soil underneath the ego in the soul, which is knowing that even if you're in a confused relationship or a confused job or a confused time in history, whatever is happening on any level, the first step to meeting it is knowing that you have inside you the absolute truth of what you need to do. Even if your normal everyday conscious nature hasn't contacted yet, that's okay. That's not the worst thing in the world. That's that's not really a problem, but it's going to be a problem until you cement the first step inside you. Whatever's going on in my life right now or in the world, even if the world is exploding in a nuclear holocaust, what, whatever is going on, I have to know that there's this deep inner part of me that knows exactly what to do with that lover, with that relationship, with that marriage, with this life, with this world. And if that's not firm in you, if right now my words sound like a good idea, you, you don't have it. It's not a good idea. It's got to be that you make love to it and it gives birth. It's not just an idea. And so you got to have that in you. You need that in your gut. You, you need that in your in your balls. You need that in your in your vagina. You got to have that in your blood and your body and your chakras. Whatever this relationship, whatever this wacky thing is, some deep core part of me knows exactly what to do. What I've been in this thing for a long time and I and I haven't found it yet because the normal everyday part of you hasn't yet gone deep enough to find that answer out. Or if you already did that, it scared the shit out of you and you jumped out of it and you're pretending you don't know it. You know, Mark, one thing that's really helped me do exactly what you're talking about. Every morning I do a meditation, 20 minutes, and a regular part of that is please help me stay connected to the part of me that is all knowing that it, it exists in another realm. I ask for help with it because it's hard. You know, we, it, this, this illusion of reality that we're in is really convincing. And so I just, I ask and I find that that just opens up access to answers and to insights when I need them. And then sometimes even in the conflict itself, asking for help for that, you know, so you're in the tension, you're in, you're, you're caught up in the illusion of we're fighting with each other and you know, all that, all that. And I will ask in that moment, like, help me see this from a higher perspective. Help me see this from the truth. Help me bring the truth into this, this situation. And I'm often surprised with what with what happens. It's not what I would think would happen, but it it usually uh, serves to calm things down. It sounds like a lot of what you've been going through is learning how to ask. Yes, you're really learning how to ask, Amanda. Right. Yes, because yeah. I know I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know that there's and I know there's support available to us, and that we have to ask. In order yeah. to receive it. Yeah. 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 Okay. That was number one. What's number two? Yeah. One was the what. What What do I need to do? What do I feel? What it, What is my truth? Two is the how, which usually ends up including the, the when and the where. And so once once you get the what, what do I need to do? Whatever the question is. What what you need to do is get down to the part of you that knows the answer, because you do. It's in you. Now, for some people, and this might have to do with their astrology signs and things like that, but for some people, it's not quite so much getting down in and under to the part of them that knows the answer as spreading out to the galaxy and just getting it from nature and and wholeness or both, you know, it, it, uh, you know, Aquarians tend to do the latter, tend to go out, tend to go out with it. Um, and so so now you go down in and you spend time saying, I'm not sure what to do with my marriage, but I know some part of me knows. And you go down in and then let's say you get there. Oh, I need to end this. 
That could be what you find. And if that is your truth, so now step two is then the how do I act upon that truth? And that the how of it usually is connected to the when and the where. They they all kind of go together because you got the truth. In this case, it's I have to end something. So how do I do that? What is the most loving way to do that? What what is um what kind of support do I need to embody my truth? You know, um, do I need to recruit other people into this? Do I, you know, do, do I need to call for a sit down with the person and open my heart? I mean, how, how does it need to happen? Right. Mark, do you believe, you know, it's said a lot of times in especially like spiritual circles and, and things that, if you have something unresolved in you, let's say you let's say you leave a marriage or you leave a relationship because you're not happy and there's you know things that aren't right about that, that you'll then attract the next relationship to work out basically the same things until you resolve whatever it is within yourself. Do you believe that's true or do you believe that's like an oversimplification? I think it's true and false. I think it may be an oversimplification. I think there's truth in that. It's not totally false, but um, but I have to qualify that because human beings are not androids or computers or machines. You know, that's like questions with reincarnation when somebody says someone else, someone had three lifetimes where they killed people. What's going to happen to them in this life? I have no fucking idea. Mm. Because why? Because there are as many ways of being human as there are human beings, right? So one person might end a marriage and there could be leftover uh, lessons in there that they did not learn from it before they got out of it. And then grace could come along and they could go to Hawaii and have an ayahuasca ceremony and meet someone in the ceremony that they happily spend the rest of their life with and they have a great connection. That's not impossible to happen. What probably happens more frequently than that is some bit of the uh, unlearned lesson gets carried out and it's hard for us human beings to learn our lessons until we reenact some new version of the dysfunction. This is something about like a gene in the human species. It's, it's just part of our makeup very few of us learn our lessons without recreating some version of the dissatisfying former relationship pattern. I'm, I'm Libra, the sign of relationship. So this is like my whole life. And, you know, this is my field of deep gra graduate thesis, this whole relationship stuff that we're talking about. So I, I think more frequently what you say is correct, but to much greater and lesser extents. You might have a real hard time in your first marriage and you get out of it without fully resolving it all. And then you might meet some new person who there's a little bit of that same thing in there with, but maybe just enough to juice it, maybe just enough to to um, roto till the compost, you know, turn yeah. over the shit, you know. There may be enough like motivating qualities for you to stick with it in that case. You know, there may be enough things that do work that the things that aren't working, you're, you're more motivated to actually address those things or whatever. You're in a different part of your life. So what I'm hearing is, yes, it's probably true, but it's not necessarily bad. It doesn't. And it, it also doesn't mean you necessarily should stay where you're at because you may have greater odds at resolving this, whatever this not is in a different circumstance. And sometimes that's what's required. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Relationship is the fast school. And um, those of us whose lives have been based on relationship, you know, I've I've moved through incarnation on love power. You know, the starts and stoppings of relationships literally used to fire me back and forth from coast to coast. Like a relationship in North Carolina ended and spun me to Santa Cruz. A relationship in Santa Cruz ended and spun me up to um Whidbey Island, a, a relationship on Whidbey Island ended and threw me back to Vermont. I mean, I just moved around on love power and it, it's the fast school 
because, and I knew this, I knew this, I was born with this one. I, when I was like four years old, I started searching for my soulmate consciously, I, you know? And I remember my kindergarten teacher told my mother, Mark is fine, but he keeps picking up his chair and putting it in the girl's half of the room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I was I, I was on it, you know? And so, but what I've learned is that, see, I sensed, especially as an adolescent, that all the places I needed to go in life, I could never get to on my own. I, I needed the portal. I needed love as an opening. And, and you know, like the Sufis have this beautiful idea that they got from Rumi and Shams, which is if two people meet in truth, the, the Sufi word for this meeting is sokbet. If two people meet in sokbet, in truth, that a portal to the whole universe opens and the universe changes. This is my truth. This is the only way I've ever known how to do love. I don't know any, any other way to do this. And I suspect you're really the same. Yes. Like some oh. part of you knows this. You said that and I went, oh my God, absolutely. That That is absolute truth right there. What you just yeah. said. You, you also gave us a mantra at the 2024 forecast event. Can you repeat that mantra? Do you remember what it was? Um, I, I'm, I, it's like on the tip of my tongue. I don't remember it. It was, I am here oh, oh. and I see you. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. That's this thing I, I discovered I, that I call the square root of love. It, it's like, you can't boil down relationship to anything more simple and primal than I am here and I see you. And and you got to play with that one like karmic theater, because mm -hmm. it's like I, the me that is, I am, I am, I am here. And I'm not just here. I see you. Not I see you at my own expense. I no longer see myself. I just see you. Not I am here and I'm never going to climb into over to there, but I am here and I see you. That's the base of all relationship. You, 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 you cannot claim a deeper practice. If you and I are having any trouble, I'm here, Amanda, and I see you. And I'm not saying my way is the right way. And I'm also not saying um, I'm going to capitulate to your way. I'm just... That always brings it back into present time because wh whatever it is, there's a I am here and I see you. That alone might be our homework for this transit. <laughs> you know, if we do find ourselves in conflict situations, see if you can find that statement. Like, see if you can access it. And even if you're saying it to yourself, you know, I mean, so often there's aspects of ourselves that we're not embodying, we're not acknowledging. There's, you know, scared, hurt, frustrated, unseen aspects of ourselves. So just that statement alone, it it, it softens everything. It it enables the truth to come through. So I, I think that that alone could really help people start to get into what that place of truth, like you said, you know, we're looking for that part of ourselves that knows the truth. So yeah. a, a statement like that may help us actually find that even more readily, right? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mark. So you are going to be a teacher in the Inner Circle, our membership group, coming up in October, and you're going to be teaching a mastery class and helping our members learn how to read a chart from the soul, from this soul level perspective. Can you tell us a little bit about what they're going to be learning? Yeah. Astrology is storytelling. And it all depends upon what kind of story you are digging for, you are hunting when you look at the birth chart, uh, even when you look at a sign of the zodiac, where are you seeking a story of faith and hope and regeneration? Are you seeking a story of conflict, conquest, 
And so when you look at the birth chart, seeking a story of faith and hope and regeneration, um, any sign, any part of the chart, any aspect can be taken for its um, resurrective power. This, this gets back to something um, that Rudolf Steiner supposedly said, which is that um, a friend of Steiner's approached him one day and said, I've been watching you for years and I have this question, which is, why would someone who knows as much of astrology as you know always schedule their most important world events on days of Mercury retrograde? And Steiner supposedly said, if I don't turn that around, who will? Wow. <sighs> I'm sorry. I just feel like I in interrupted you, but that is no, a wow. No, no you okay. did. You just... You drew my attention though, because I want I wanted to see what your face looked like when you said that. That's a huge wow. I mean, <laughs> I actually tend to do something very similar to Rudolf Steiner, so I think I might adopt his little uh, theory. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the whole way I do astrology, Amanda. That's the whole thing. It's that these planetary dyads don't dictate the terms of the universe. They they don't push you around. If somebody has Saturn in Scorpio in the 12th house, they're not doomed for the next seven lifetimes. So, so when you reach to the birth chart or to astrology in any kind of a way, and what you're looking for is the turnaround, what you're looking for is the resurrection, the, the rebirth, the, you know, the 1960s of it, how are we going to explode it up? Um, you can find that, you know, and so so when I'm looking in the birth chart, I'm not looking in it so much as looking through it. For me, the birth chart is a scope. It's just it's like a telescope or, or a microscope. It's just a scope. And when I'm looking in there, I'm looking at why did this person decide to reincarnate? What are they what what's living in them? Where is your love? What creative seed is packed down into you that as your human nature experiences its ups and downs in the karmic theater of incarnation, what are you really doing? Who are you really down there? The place that you don't usually get to without ayahuasca or magic mushrooms or, or, or uh, sacred medicines where, where you realize that Underneath everything else you seem to be is this other thing who you are. And it's nameless and it's unquantifiable, but it is real. And it connects you to the realness of the whole universe. And most people don't get there without sacred medicines, but I've kind of made a living in the last 40 years by, by continuing the medicine journey when I'm not on any medicine. And one great way to do that is through the birth chart and through music. And so that that's how I'm going to be teaching. Amazing. Okay. So you're going to teach us how to look through that, that lens that you're looking through. Amazing. Mark, is there anything else? Oh, if you like Mark Borax and you want to keep watching some other episodes that we've done with him, there is an amazing episode that we did in October of 2023 called Astrology Predictions for 2024, Year of the Wood Dragon. And it it uh, was published on October 11th. And if you are curious about the year of the dragon, which we're, we're embarking upon right now, actually, um, right around now, uh, it is a fascinating episode. So much goodness in this episode. So go check it out. Mark, is there anything that you want to leave us with as we're in the midst of this Venus-Mars conjunction in Aquarius? Any final words or thoughts? Well, now that Pluto's in Aquarius, the, uh, the god of hell has entered the land of the water bearer. And so there's a deep mythopoetic um, summoning 
going on with the god of hell and the sign of Aquarius, because Aquarius is the vessel. Aquarius isn't the, the human being, it's the human as an instrument through which transformation can occur. And so the more that you can vessel yourself, realize that you're an instrument, that, that the love of the universe wants to stream into your crown and down through your body into the earth, into the living earth. And, and if you can gain the art and the skill of uh, navigating your way around the world as a vessel, you know, letting that happen in various ways, you're really tuning in with the times. Beautiful. I love that. Thinking of Aquarius, because I, I often think of Aquarius as humanity, but I love that additional layer of the human as a vessel for the divine. So wonderful. Mark, thank you so much for being here. You are always such a pleasure to engage with. I hope all of you have enjoyed this discussion. I hope that you've taken away the golden nuggets that are yours to take away. Thank you so much for being a part of our community. Thank you as always for making astrology a part of your life. Can't wait to connect with you on the next episode. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon.